not quite yet. Go. Good evening. My name is Kai Bird. I'm the executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography at CUNY in New York City, although I'm speaking to you from Washington, D.C. in this pandemic. Uh, the Leon Levy Center, as you know, its mission is to promote the art and craft of biography and to give platforms to biographers to talk about their work and otherwise to have uh, intellectual discussions on major books of the day. Our work has been sponsored all these years for the last 13 years by Le the Leon Levy Foundation and Shelby White, who's been very stubborn and persistent in supporting the, the craft of biography. And uh, our next event is this Tuesday, September 22nd at 6 p.m. on the same Crowdcast platform at 6 p.m. when the eminent biographer Judith Thurman will give the annual Leon Levy lecture. Her lecture is entitled, The Accidental Biographer. But tonight I'm delighted to introduce David Nassau and Peter Beinart to discuss David's new book, The Last Million. I will always be in debt to David Nassau because about four years ago, I was sitting on the beach in Miami when I got a phone call from him, I thought I was perfectly happy, unemployed, and working fitfully on a biography of Jimmy Carter. But David said, no, I had to come to New York and apply for this job promoting biography. Anyway, David talked me into it, and I'm delighted he did. It's been a lot of fun, and he is a wonderful scholar and gentleman and now a good friend. He retired last year from CUNY um, after many years and immediately went to work finishing this very important book on post-war refugees. David is best known as a, as a veteran biographer. He's written large biographies of Andrew Carnegie, William Randolph Hearst, and Joseph Kennedy, all major, major biographies. He's twice been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and won both the Bancroft Prize and the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize. And last year he gave the prestigious annual Leon Levy Lecture on Biography. I should say on a personal note that this new book of his is of particular interest to me and my wife, whose 94-year-old mother, my mother-in-law, was one of those last million. She made it to America in 1947 via Austria and Italy. David will be in conversation this evening with Peter Beinhardt, a professor of journalism at CUNY, but Peter's real job in life is being one of this country's most astute and prolific public intellectuals. I have long admired Peter's incisive essays in the Atlantic, the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, and elsewhere. His essays are always thought-provoking and even courageous no more so than when he casts his eye on the problems of peace in Israel and pa Palestine. He is the author of three books, most recently, The Crisis of Zionism. Peter and David will discuss the last million for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, just remember, viewers, you can type your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your Crowdcast screen. And on that note, I now turn it over to Peter to interrogate Pete, David Nassau about his new book. Thank you, guys. Thank you very, very much for that, Kai. It's really, it's a, it's a privilege um, to be talking to David and to have been able to, to read his, um, his, his beautifully written um, and very relevant, I would say, book. Um, and so, David, I thought um, maybe I might just start with actually just a terminological question. Um, um, what is a displaced person? Is that different than a refugee? Um, and how should we understand these categories that of course you, you write about in the middle of the 20th century but are still so much with us tragically today? Displaced person was a category that was invented really by the United Nations, the UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. And in the beginning, it was different from a refugee. 
it was displaced persons, as I refer to them among the last million, were those who had been displaced by the war and who had been displaced from allied nations. So that if you came from a nation that was allied to Germany, you were not considered a displaced person and you were not going to be given assistance by the United Nations, by agency, by, by UNRWA. It's a slippery term. And there's a wonderful German historian who said that it's an absolutely incorrect term, that you don't displace people, you displace your keys or a shoe. And from the very beginning to call these people displaced persons was to, to denigrate, to degrade them by the term that was used. But the term stuck and the term continues to be used among the refugee population. So uh, so this million that we're talking about, as you said, this is, these are a million Europeans from, um, uh, who, who were from countries that had been uh, on the ally side in the war, who were, who were forced from their homes during the course of the war, or, am I, or, am I, or is there some element of that that's not right? No, it's, that, that's correct. Mm -hmm. there, there's one tricky part of this. There, there are three groups, really, that make up the displaced persons. There are the guest workers, the slave laborers, most of them from Poland and the Ukraine, who were forced by the Germans. They are deported into Germany to take the jobs that had been left open by the German soldiers on the Eastern Front. The second group is a group that comes in 1944 and 1945. They are Latvians, Estonians, Lithuanians who are fleeing their homelands in advance of the Red Army and the reoccupation of their homelands by the Soviet Union. Lots of these displaced persons fled the Red Army because they had collaborated with the Nazis. The third group are the Jews, and they are the group who are left behind in concentration camps and in labor camps. As the war comes to a close and the Germans know they're losing, they relocate the survivors from the Polish labor camps, work camps and death camps, and they move them into Germany to put them to work often in underground armaments and munitions plants. And they put them to work, the, the decision is made rather than gas them to work them to death. And in that way, the Third Reich will get the last ounce of life and energy from these people before they die. And can you just put numbers on these three different categories, these, these slave uh, laborers brought into Germany to replace the Germans who had gone onto the front, these people from the Baltics, uh, non-Jews from the Baltics who, who flee the Red Army, and then the Jews who are, who are, who are being moved uh, from, the, from the concentration camp. Yeah, the, the largest number are probably the um, guest laborers and the slave laborers, most of them Polish or Ukrainian. And there are probably 600,000 of them. There may be 150,000 in the beginning, 150,000 from Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. And in the very beginning on VE Day, um, liberation, there are only about 50,000, uh, between 30 and 50,000 Jews who are left in the camps in Dachau, in Bergen-Belsen, in Buchenwald, as the Allied soldiers liberate them. What happens in the first year, year and a half after VE Day, is that the Poles start to go home again. And they are replaced in the displaced persons camps by Jewish survivors who had spent the war years, most of them in hiding with the partisans or as laborers 
in the Soviet Union. The vast majority of Polish Jews who survived the war survive it because they are able to escape into the Soviet Union. And the Soviets who need labor move them into the Asiatic parts of the Soviet Union where they're, where they're put to work. When the war is over, they're allowed to come back to Poland. Stalin provides them with transportation. They come back to Poland and they discover in 1946, that the anti-Semitism in Poland is such that they can't survive there. The anti-Semitism, the pogroms, the violence, and the only place for them to feel safe is a tragic irony of war, is in Germany, in displaced persons camps. So by 1946, 1947, the number of Poles decreases, the number of Jews increases to maybe 200 to 250,000. So tell us about these DP camps. How many are there and, and, and how are, who's running them? Yeah, there, there, are, there are literally hundreds of, of displaced persons camps. Across, and in which countries? The vast majority of them are in Germany. There are some in Italy. Um, if anybody's ever been to the Cine Cita studios where the great, Italian movies were made, that became a displaced persons camps. There are displaced persons camps in Austria as well, but 80 to 90% of the displaced persons in the camps are in Germany. Some are tiny, some are huge. Some are villages that the, or towns that the British and the Americans uh, clear of Germans and they move in displaced persons. Others are former army barracks, uh, hotels, resorts. Um, the displaced persons camps are divided up by nationality. So there are Lithuanian camps and Ukrainian camps and Polish camps and Jewish camps. In the very beginning, the Jews are not recognized as a group unto themselves. So the Lithuanian Jews are forced into camps with non-Jewish Lithuanians, and the Polish Jews were non-Jewish Poles. And the, the consequences for the Jews are, are frightful because in, in many cases, they end up in camps with guards from concentration camps or with the family members of those who had taken away their, their livelihoods, their, their farms, their apartments. It's not until two, months after the war has ended, that the Jews are given their own camps. And who is running the camps? And, and, and what are the, and, and can talk a little bit about the condition. Yeah, the, the camps are run by, Franklin Roosevelt in 1943 understands that when World War II is over, there are gonna be millions and millions of refugees. And rather than have them suffer the way they did after the First World War, he is instrumental in putting together a United Nations organization. Its job is rehabilitation and to care for the refugees until they can be sent home. So UNRWA administers the camps and the Americans supply 80% of the goods. In the beginning, the security, the shelter, the food, the medical supplies are given by the army and the day-to-day -day administration is by these United Nations group. When it becomes clear that the last million, that a million of these refugees are not gonna return home for different reasons, the Americans and the British decide that they have no choice but to set up a second international group, the International Refugee Organization. And its job will not be rehabilitation, will be resettlement. Um, so for the first year and a half, it's UNRWA. For this next year and a, next two, three, four years, it's the International Refugee Organization who does the day-to-day. -day. Right. Now, like POW camps, it's the inmates. It's the occupants, it's the residents who really run the camps. They elect the officials, they set up the committees, they decide who's gonna live who, where, 
they run the kitchens, they run the medical facilities. Um, and in effect, what you have in Germany are these little Ukrainian villages, these Polish villages, these Lithuanian villages, and these Jewish encampments in exile. And, and for all of these groups, there, there is a heightening of, of national aspirations. For the Jews, certainly, there is this sense that the Jews who are in these camps are the surviving remnant, they call themselves. And they take very seriously the, the notion that they have to preserve, they owe it to the six million dead to keep Judaism alive. And they encourage all sorts of activities, not simply religious activities, but other activities to foster a sense of, of solidarity until the moment when they can move to their homeland in Palestine. I wanna to get to the Jewish story, which you tell so well, but, but just because perhaps it may be even a less known story, I, I wanna just give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about those, the, the non-Jews, right? You're talking about people largely, a lot of them from the Baltic countries, who don't want to go back and live under the red under under the in the Soviet Union uh, or in, in under the Red Army? Um, and so, um, talk a little bit about what their nationalism means at, when they can't be at home and where their aspirations are to go and where they ultimately end up. Yeah, the you have to remember, and this is one of the things I learned in doing research for this book, is that. World War gives way to Cold War almost immediately, almost at once. And in Poland, there was an underground, a cold civil war and then a warm civil war between those who supported the Soviets and viciously anti-communist, anti-Soviet elements largely centered around the church which were violently anti-communist and anti-Soviet. And in the Polish camps, there was a continual agitation between the anti-communists who said to the guest workers, these are 20 year olds who had been stolen from their homes when they were 16, 17 and put to work in Germany. The anti-communist elements in the camps including the church and former army officers and large landholders say, don't go back to Poland. It is your responsibility to stay out of Poland and to create a resistance movement so that you're ready to join in the fight to liberate Poland from the Soviet Union. For the Latvians, the Lithuanians. And sorry, and their, their vision is that they're going to stay in Germany and do that? They don't know where they're going to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. they don't know whether they're going to stay. They're, going to the Polish nation and they're not going to go back to Poland. To go right. back to Poland, right. dominated by the Soviets, is to give in. Right, right. To support a Poland in 1946, 1947, is to support the communists. Or so they were told. For the Latvians, the, the Lithuanians, and the Estonians, it's, it's a little bit different. They also hope and pray that the Americans and the British are gonna start World War III and are gonna push the Soviets out of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. And the Ukrainians in particular, they turn their displaced persons camps into military training zones. The Latvians, the Lithuanians, and the Estonians pursue a kind of cultural nationalism to keep alive their sense of nationhood until such time as the Soviets can be pushed out. The difference is between the Polish, in the Polish camps, there's a real debate that goes on about whether to repatriate or not. In the Latvian, the Lithuanian, and Estonian, there's not. There are 90% of the people there are violently, viciously anti-communist. 
So where do these folks then, these uh, anti-communist uh, Poles, uh, Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Ukrainians, where do they end up? Yeah, in, in the beginning, the, the UN agency was supposed to repatriate them. Everybody was supposed to go home. That was Roosevelt's idea, that was Churchill's idea, and later Atlee's idea. Everybody goes home. The Soviets and the Poles and the Eastern Europeans, who were now under the domination of the Soviet Union in one way or another, demanded that every Pole, every Latvian, every Ukrainian go home again. And they were furious. They said, the United Nations has no business sheltering and feeding these people. It should send them home. And if they don't want to go home, let them make their way in Germany. The Americans and the British said, no, we are not forcibly sending anybody back to a communist dominated nation they don't want to return to. Now, there's a Cold War sentiment there, obviously, but there's also a, a kind of humanitarian notion that individuals have a right to choose their nation. Or at least this is what Eleanor Roosevelt, who represents the United States and the United Nations, says over and over again. Um, the Soviets are adamant that the only place for these people is to return, to rebuild their nations. And the Soviets say anybody who doesn't want to go back to Latvia or the Ukraine or Poland doesn't want to go back either because they're lazy and they don't want to work hard to rebuild their nations or they're war criminals and they're afraid that they're gonna be punished for their deeds. So then, I mean, ultimately they're not sent back, right? So they, are, they, they end up uh, eventually being given um, new homes in, you know, in, uh, in, the, in, in North America, in, 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 in other parts of Europe and in Australia, where? It's a, remar it's a remarkable story and it's one of the first battles of the Cold War is what's going to happen to the last million, to the displaced persons. Ultimately, the British and the Americans put together a coalition of nations and they create this new organization, the International Refugee Organization, and its mandate is to resettle the displaced persons, the last million, wherever there is a labor shortage, wherever there is a need. So what, what happens is that the displaced persons camps are turned into you know, meat markets, um, employment centers, and Brazil, Argentina, Canada, Costa Rica, Venezuela, I mean, 20 to 30 nations that belong to the IRO, they send labor recruiters into the camps and they pick and choose those who can go into the factories, work the fields, go underground into the mines. Uh, it begins with Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain has an extraordinary labor shortage after the war. Lots and lots of uh, the people who had worked, the teenagers are sent back to school. Lots and lots of people leave Great Britain for Canada or Australia. Uh, the British decide that the easiest way to solve their labor shortage is to import displaced persons. And they begin by taking Latvian girls and putting them to work in tuberculosis sanitaria and then in hospitals, jobs that no Brit wants to take. The Belgians need, the, need minors. Uh, the French need minors. The Australians need a little bit of everything. The Canadians need a little bit of everything. So they, they come and recruit. Uh, the Soviets object. Soviet said, this is dreadful. This is another form of guest of slave labor. Um, but the displaced persons want nothing more than to get the hell out of Germany. And, and they will literally go anywhere where they're offered a job and a promise, maybe a promise of citizenship. And you tell the story in the book of how actually the, the non-Jewish uh, Met people in the displaced displaced persons are, tend to be preferred over the Jews in this process. Um, can you just talk a little bit about why that this process yeah. of basically being plucked 
from uh, different countries who can who are willing to open their their doors. Every nation, from the you know the Canadians, the Australians, the Argentinians, the South Americans, uh, the South Africans, they want the Latvians. And if they can't get Latvians, they want Estonians. If they can't get Estonians, they'll take Lithuanians or Ukrainians or Poles. They want the Latvians because the Latvians and the Lithuanians and the Estonians only got into Germany in 1944 and 1945. And they were healthy, their families were intact. More than that, they were white and they were Protestant. And the sense was they were hardworking people and they'll fit right in to Australia or you know, Bolivia. Um, the Poles were less wanted because there was a sense that they were a little bit lazy and they were Catholic. Nobody wanted the Jews. Every one of these nations sent explicit, sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit orders to the labor recruiters uh, don't bring any Jews into this country. We don't want Jews because they're clannish, because they're probably Bolsheviks or communists, because they don't know how to work, because every stereotype, every myth about the Jew is brought to, to prominence. And in 1947, 1948, 1949, the Latvian camps begin to empty out, the camps with the Ukrainians, all of the camps, and 200 and 250,000 Jews remain in place, with one exception. The only way the Jews can get out of Germany is by illegally entering Palestine because the British won't let any in legally. And thus begins the illegal Aliyah, Aliyah Bet. Um, we know most from the story of the Exodus. These are displaced persons. And the only way they can leave Germany is illegally on ships to go to Israel, to go to Palestine. There is no Israel. Right. So, so talk about the... Um the, the, the sentiment among the Jews who are in these displaced persons campus in 1945, 1946, 1947, obviously there's not a Zionist consensus among Eastern European Jews before the war. There's a whole range of opinions from traditionalist religious objections to Zionism to, to, to Bundists, to communists, to people who um, just would have preferred to, you know, go to the United States, um, along with, of course, along with Zionists. So, so talk about that, uh, how hegemonic does Zionism become um, in those post-war years among the Jews in the displaced persons? And what are the internal what are the internal discussions like? The debates that go on in the beginning are just mm. extraordinary mm. because the Bundists say mm. um, to the Polish Jews and the Lithuanian Jews, the few that Lithuanian Jews that are that are left behind, go home. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Poland. Let's go back to Lithuania. Let's mm -hmm. build rebuild the community that was once here. Mm -hmm. The Zionists said, are, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is no place for a Jew in Europe. Mm -hmm. We have to leave Europe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Zionists quickly win the argument. Mm -hmm. Now, when asked by American journalists or by UNRWA or by the IRO, 99% of the Jews say, we want to go to Palestine. The reality is that a much smaller percentage want to go to Palestine or want to go to an independent Israel. Why? Because they've just been through a horrendous war. Mm -hmm. And the last thing they want mm -hmm. is to enter a country Mm -hmm. that is on the precipice mm -hmm. of war mm -hmm. or after 1948 is mm -hmm. at war. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, they say we want to go to Palestine because they want that to be an option. Large numbers, and again, we don't know how many, want to go to the United States or if they have relatives in Canada or Australia or, or Cuba, they, they want to go there. But they're mo mostly not allowed. 
they're not allowed. There's, there's no option. There's, there is, in, if, if I can jump a bit um, to, to 1948, Harry Truman recognizes, and Clement Attlee, they, they recognize that they can't establish an independent German Republic, West German Republic, which they have to do as the bulwark of the Cold War and the Marshall Plan, uh, with a quarter million Jews in camps there. They've got to get them out. And I believe, and I argue this in the book, that one of the reasons why Harry Truman recognizes the state of Israel as quickly as he does is that he realizes in, in 1948 that the only way to get the Jews out of the displaced persons camps in Europe is to send them to an independent state of Israel. Because he's not willing to let them in the United States, right? That would have been another alternative, right? <laughs> yeah. But well, since that's off the table. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah. He, you know, Truman, mm -hmm. Truman's one of the good guys here, I think. Mm -hmm. Truman understands the plight of the Jews and mm -hmm. the displaced persons. Mm -hmm. And Truman would, if someone made Truman czar, you know, he would have let in more Jews. But Truman understands that Congress isn't going to let that happen. Right. Isn't going to let that happen. Right. Um, and Truman tries for years to get the labor government of Clement Attlee to open Palestine to the Jews. And, and Truman thinks the United States is so powerful and the war is over. The British need our loans. They need our help. You know, we'll pressure them. We'll push them. The State Department says never. And Truman loses. The British refuse to open up. As long as the British hold the mandate to Palestine, they are not going to allow significant immigration. And, and Truman says to them, and it's, you know, you want to cry when you read this. Truman says, look, you don't have to worry anymore. Six million Jews were killed. You know, you don't have to worry about those six million coming to Palestine. Mm -hmm. They're only, you know, we're, we're talking about 100,000 survivors at mm -hmm. most, 200,000 at most. Mm -hmm. The British say no. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about um, the, the British um, reason for that British policy. And maybe also say something about, since obviously hovering in the background behind the British policy is the sensibility of, of the Arab population of mandatory Palestine um, and, and the sentiment among uh, among Palestinian Arabs about this prospect of, of displaced uh, Jews and displaced persons camps coming from, coming from Europe. Yeah, it, it's impossible to know what the Palestinian in the street or in the settlement or in the fields or in the villages is thinking. What we do know, it, it's also not always easy to know what the Palestinians are thinking mm -hmm. because the major spokespeople for the Palestinians are the you know, the Arab nations, the Arab League, mm -hmm. and they are unalterably opposed mm -hmm. to the entrance of one more Jew mm -hmm. into Palestine. Mm -hmm. And they threaten, they, you know, they, they threaten war. And the British are not only afraid of war, mm -hmm. but the British realize that the, they're going to lose India. Mm -hmm. India is gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that if they want to maintain any semblance of their, their former greatness as an imperial power, they've got to have access to Arab oil. They've got to have friends in the Middle East. And they are unwilling to sacrifice the possibilities of friendship with the Arab nations. Um, to the sentimental, what they consider to be the sentimental quest of the Jews to return to Palestine. But it's more than that. The British say to the, to the Americans and they say to Truman, look, you know, put your money where your mouth is. You know, right. maybe we'll consider taking in some Jews into Palestine if you let some Jews into the United States. Right. And right. the Canadians and the Australians and the Brazilians say the same thing. Right. 
They say, right. don't try to pressure us to take Jews unless you're willing to open your doors. Right, 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 right. And I think hovering behind that, as you've mentioned a little bit, is, is there are certainly uh, Palestinian leaders and, and activists and writers who, 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 are see, who, are, who by this point believe that Zionism is likely to lead to their dispossession. Um, so that I think is, is hovering in the background, I think, of, of, of what a lot of Palestinian politically active Palestinians are thinking well, you by, know, it, by the mid 1940s. It's, it's more, it, that's absolutely, absolutely true. Mm. And, and more than that, they say, we're not going to be forced because of a war in Europe. It's right. terrible what happened to the Jews, right. but it's right. not our problem. You know, right. and, and how dare mm. you European powers in the United States tell us that we have to solve this problem. Right. And they speak eloquently about right. the need for Arab and Palestinian self-determination. They say if the Jews are going to enter this country, it's going to be because we invite them, not because they're forced on us. Right. So talk a little bit about the, um, this, this process you describe in the book, which you know, became famous with the exodus of, this, of these um, kind of uh, you know, cloak and dagger operations to try to get Jews um, through, you know, across Europe, across the Mediterranean, into mandatory Palestine, even against the wishes of the British Navy? The, you know, the, the British are defeated, and they defeated time and time and time again. They try to stop the passage of boats. They threaten the Italians, they threaten the Bulgarians, they threaten the French. Um, they say in the end, if any ship leaves with Jews and arrives in Palestine, we're going to send that ship right back and you're going to have to worry about those Jews. Um, but nothing they can do solves the problem, what, the, what they conceive as a problem. With the help of the Mossad, with funding from Americans, with a lot of American Jews who, you know, become ship captains and sailors and, and fund the exodus. The Jews are taken um, in the middle of the night, put into trucks, taken across the border, out of the displaced persons camps, snuck across the border, uh, taken to Marseille. The exodus leaves from Marseille. In Marseille, the Jewish agency and the Mossad hire all the street photographers they can find to take pictures and they hire all the forgers they can find in the Marseille area to make passports for 1,500 Jews um, to sell. It is an extraordinary operation. The Jews don't get, most of them don't get to Palestine. What the British do is they stop them in Haifa. They either turn the ships towards Cyprus or they let the ships land. And as soon as the Jews get off the ship, they're put on other ships and sent to Cyprus and put in displaced persons camps in Cyprus. Um, eventually it's, it's just too much. I mean, and one of the reasons why the British give up the mandate is that they cannot control the illegal Aliyah. There's, there's nothing they can do. They, again, they threaten the Jews, they threaten every nation on earth um, to stop these ships from leaving, and they lose. They're um, prob yeah. Go no, no, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say that we, we don't know how many, but probably 20, 30,000 at least displaced Jews um, make the illegal aliyah uh, to Palestine. The vast majority end up in, in camps in Cyprus. So I want to, we, um, we have about 20 minutes left or so, and I, in a, I want to get to questions. So feel free to, to put them in the, uh, in, in the, to throw them in here. Um, but I want to kind of end our section by talking a little bit about the debate in the United States about uh, admitting um, these refugees, um, what it was like at that point, and, and what we can learn from it 
today, since obviously we have been in, involved in a in a debate about about immigrants, about refugees um, in the United States quite intensely in recent years. The now this was uh, what can I say? This was not an easy book to write. Well, the the book once I had done the research sort of wrote itself, but I was continually. I mean, distressed is not the word. Um, I, I was bewildered and upset by the rhetoric in Congress. It, it was a new form of anti-Semitism. What happens in Congress from 1946 on is that there is this hard core of Southern Democrats and Midwestern Republicans with other Democrats and Republicans thrown in, who say we cannot allow any of the Jews to enter this country. They don't put it in that way. They say we cannot allow any displaced persons who entered the camps from Poland to come to the United States. Why? because they're Bolsheviks, they're communists. They were liberated by the Soviet, by the Red Army. They lived in Poland, they lived in the Soviet Union, they survived there. And what happens is this, this oldest of myths, a myth that the papacy had been using, you know, since the beginning of the 20th century, and the Catholic Church had grabbed onto was that Jews are dangerous because they're Bolsheviks. The Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy theory was resurrected in the United States and eventually defeated any and all attempts to allow the Jewish displaced persons to get any significant number, number of visas. Now the American Jewish community doesn't know what to do. The organized American Jewish community, part of the organized American Jewish community, the, the Zionists said, it's okay if the Jews can't come to the United States, let them go to Palestine. Those who want, those who are non-Zionist or anti-Zionist, are afraid to bring up the question of Jewish migration. And in the end, there are no advocates for the migration of Jews. The Jewish community only talks about the migration of the displaced persons. Um, they don't use the word Jew. They, because, they they feel, because they feel like that will play into the anti-Semitic uh, opposition because they feel that it will play into the anti-Semitic opposition. Absolutely. Because they fear that in the post-war period, in the immediate post-war period, that they don't want uh, a return to, to you know, anti-Semitism. Um, and they're afraid. And they're afraid. And as, as a result, uh, it's, it's not until 1948, three years after the end of the war, that a Displaced Persons Act is passed in Congress, and it's passed by a coalition of Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish groups, and then Congress does its own jujitsu and changes the bill to make ineligible for visas 90%, that 90% of the Jewish displaced persons who had come into the camps from Poland many of them having lived, survived the war in the Soviet Union. So one of the, um, uh, one of those Jews that you mentioned is Ray Kushner, uh, uh, Jared, I think it's Jared Kushner's grandmother, correct? Yeah. Um, um, and so I wonder if, um, if, uh, if Jared Kushner were to read this book and, and read this story, including the story of his grandmother, what would you, what, 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 what lessons would it, do you think it holds for the United States today? <laughs> 
If only. Trying to get uh, you in trouble. Yeah, mm. if only. No, Jared Kushner knows damn well mm. that his grandparents were displaced persons. Mm. And he knows damn well that his, his grandmother, Ray Kushner, said, and it's in the, the Holocaust Museum, she says, nobody wanted us. Nobody wanted us. Mm. Um, and they didn't get into this country. They spent years in displaced persons camps before they were allowed in. Uh, Stephen Miller, the architect of Trump's policy, I mean, his great great grandparents were Jewish immigrants, you know, and Trump himself. I mean, his grandparents, his, his father, I think, and mother were, or his. He, two of his three wives and his grandparents were, were immigrants. Um, part of what's going on, and we, and we have to be clear about it, is the last million had something going for them. One, there was a sense that there was a labor shortage in the world. And two, they were white Europeans. And three, the vast majority of them were Protestants and Catholics. Today's displaced persons, today's refugees are for the most part, not white, and for the most part, not Protestant, um, or Catholic or Jewish. And right. that's a lot, you know, against them. In the, you know, the United States talks, we, we talk and we talk and we talk about doing the right thing, about being humanitarian. But in the case of the list, last million, um, geopolitical concerns and falsehoods, Myths were allowed to determine American policy. And as long as we refuse to consider humanitarian concerns, and as long as we allow our politicians to spread lies about the immigrants, um, we're not you know, doing our part to make this a livable world for those who have been displaced by civil war or by war between states. Um, I want to go to a few questions in the few minutes we have left. We have actually a, a, a question from, uh, from, from Kai Bird um, um, about something you, you write about in the book about IF Stone's role and his reporting on the issue of displaced persons in Israel-Palestine. Talk a little about it. Tell people for who they might not know who IF yeah, Stone, Stone is. This, yeah, IF Stone is this iconic left um, reporter, one of the world's great reporters, wrote for the nation for years and years and years and years. Brilliant, brilliant reporter. And I.F. Stone wrote about, he wrote a book about the illegal immigration to, to Palestine. And I, I quote extensively from it. it. It's a remarkable book about what these displaced persons have gone through and what they go through to try to get to Palestine. Um, I recommend it. Um, we have another question about um, former concentration camp guards or camp administrators, uh, uh, sorry, former concentration camp guards who entered into the displaced persons camp. Um, how much awareness or concern was there that there were people who might've committed terrible atrocities in these VP camps, and then I would add, how much awareness is, or, and, or concern was there among the countries who then uh, let these, um, uh, these uh, you know, Ukrainian, Polish, Lithuanian, Latvian, Estonian, uh, displaced persons, non-Jewish displaced persons into their countries? One of the stories I didn't expect to find was the story of the war criminals and the Nazi collaborators who disguised their pasts, who made their way into the displaced persons camps, and then who ultimately came into the United States, into the UK, into Canada, Australia, and every place else. These were not, some of them were, you know, low-level bureaucrats, but large numbers of the Waffen-SS legions, the Ukrainian, the Estonian, the Latvian Waffen-SS legions, they were able to come into the United States. And why? Because the Americans, the Australians, the Brits didn't give a damn. They were 
did everything they possibly could to keep out communist sympathizers. They didn't care about Nazi collaborators. And there were ways to discover these people. The Every Jewish organization in Europe had lists of collaborators, of war criminals. But the Allies never asked for these lists. And they let these people into the camps and then they let them emigrate. And, you know, in, in, in Great Britain, when the miners discovered that some of the displaced persons who had been recruited to work in the mines had Waffen-SS tattoos in their armpits and went out on strike, the British labor government decided, well, we will put the Waffen-SS members in jobs where they don't have to take off their shirts. It was not until the 1970s that a group of American reporters um, began to raise the question and raise it publicly of the number of war criminals in this country. But by then it was too late. Many of them had you know, settled into their neighborhoods or were too old and infirm to be moved. And when some were discovered, the William F. Buckley and Pat Buchanan and a variety of anti-communist figures and anti-communist politicians said, well, you know, let him stay here. You know, let, you know, let him stay here. Don't send him back. We, we have a, someone who said that in the, in the Q&A Q &A that the audio has stopped. I don't know exactly. I hope that's not the case. But um, if, it, if it is, I, I um, make an appeal to the technical folks to, to come and help us out. But, but I'm going to just proceed as if everything is OK. Um, um, we, have a, we have a question about um, those, um, deep, uh, those uh, folks, those displaced persons, those Jews who tried to get to uh, into mandatory Palestine and um, ended up were sent to Cyprus. What ultimately happened to them? Yeah, and uh, on independence, they were the first who were allowed to move into uh, into Israel proper. Um, you know, the the United Nations mandate uh, when the United Nations took over the Palestinian mandate from the British. The British were required to open up the port of Haifa um, for the beginning of the movement of Jews from Cyprus and from Europe. The British refused for a long, long period of time. Ultimately, Haifa was opened and the shipments began. Ben Gurion needed and wanted as many Jews as possible to come into the country. Um, and the first were the from the displaced persons camps in Cyprus. We have a question about when the Jews in the DP camps learned the extent of the Holocaust. Did the Jews learned the extent of the, that's a terrific question. The Jews learned the extent of the Holocaust only when they got into the displaced persons camps. Um, when the war was over, no one quite knew. Uh, large numbers of the concentration camp victims, the inmates, didn't go into the displaced persons camps immediately. They went home. They went by truck, by rail, they hitchhiked, they walked back to Poland to try to find out if anybody was left from their families. Um, and it took a little bit of time before the news began to spread through the displaced persons camps where there were a variety of Jews from different locations um, that what had happened. Uh, one of the things that, well, let me, let me leave it at that. Okay. Um, so we're just about almost out of time, but I, I, I think one of the things that does in a way hang over um, the, this history um, is of course the, Irony, I think Edward Said called Palestinians the victims of the victims, that some of those Jews from displaced persons camps who had been dispossessed of their homes ended up 
living in the homes of Palestinians who have been forced out of their homes in 1948. Um, and the, 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 this organization which exists today, the, the UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Organization, which tends to Palestinian refugees is of course, has been defunded by the Trump administration and is a subject of ongoing controversy, as is the whole broader question of whether Palestinians should, Palestinian refugees should, should, should be allowed to, to return or whether they should be resettled, right? So you know, these kind of bizarre kind of echoes of the, of, the, of the moment and the debates that you're writing about in the late 1940s in Europe. And I just wanted to, I um, mean, you're a historian, not a, a pundit, but um, I wanted to just ask you, I guess, just to reflect a little bit um, um, on that that ongoing question, you know, seen against the the backdrop of the history that you write, the the tragic irony here is, um, and I don't know how else to describe it, uh, other than as a as a tragedy and as an ironic tragedy or tragic irony, was the only place in the world uh -huh. where the Jews were able uh -huh. to resettle and were resettled. Uh -huh was in homes, apartments, mm -hmm. villages, mm -hmm. rural settlements mm -hmm. that had been ethnically cleared mm -hmm. of Palestinians. So the displaced persons problem presented by the Jews was solved only by creating a much larger and more serious displaced persons problems. I do not mean to minimize what the, the Jews went through, but they were resettled in a homeland within three to five years at the, after the end of the war. The Palestinians who were thrown out of their homes in 1948 um, remained in refugee camps. Well, they don't remain, they've died off. Their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren remain. And as we speak in 2020, and Peter, you've written eloquently and passionately about this, the problem is no closer to solution. Um, the world seems willing to allow, and this is liberals and conservatives, right, left, center, seems willing to allow the refugees, the Palestinian refugees, to remain forever and ever and ever in these camps. There's no effort at resettlement. There's no effort at repatriation. Uh, and, and what becomes even worse is that everything that Roosevelt had fought for in 1943 in setting up UNRWA, is now being undone by Trump. The Americans were, you know, they, they were, the Americans began the international organizations to take care of refugees. And now the current administration is walking away from that. And that's, you know, it's disgraceful. Um, well, you know, there's actually, there's a, there's a very interesting book um, co-authored by the two Israeli academics, Amos Goldberg and Bashir Bashir, about the Holocaust and the Nakba. And in that, they, one of the chapters, there's a story, tell the story of, a, um, of, two, of two Holocaust survivors who, who uh, end up in Israel and who are uh, in 19, one day in 1940 given the key to a house in Haifa um, and who have just been through hell and, of course, lost everything and go and walk into this house and see that literally it's evident that people had been there very recently, that the house is tended, that this places are set at the table. And they have the, and, and the, the authors of the book in, interview them as, as elderly people decades and decades later. And they talk about how they said, we're not gonna move into this house. Not, uh, the, the, the primal kind of memory of what they had been through was too strong. Again, most people in the world and most in any circumstance are not like that. But the fact that there are some human beings who unlike Jared Kushner, can see the echoes of their own experience so powerfully, even when it's happening to people who are of a different race or religion or ethnicity, I think is you know, a source of some hope. And I think your book really um, couldn't be better timed as we uh, uh, are in this kind of crucible today, as you say, where the United States is 
is kind of taking a wrecking ball to so many of the institutions and principles that the United States helped to found in its in, in some of its finest moments. So David, thank you so much for, for, for being here for this conversation. Thank you so much for writing the book and thank you for letting me participate in it. My pleasure.